Maybe you clicked on this video because you love listening to classical symphonies, like me. But how do you compose one? I learned how, partly from curiosity, I wanted to know how are these incredibly intricate, wonderful structures put together. For several videos now, I've been showing you how a classical symphony is created by composing an example. I picked a style that would have fit well in Mozart's time. And together we've gone through the first, second, and third movements, their structure, their organization, and orchestration. Now we need a fitting end. A great final movement needs fireworks. It could be fast, could be loud, but somehow it needs to make a rousing end. Hello all, I'm Mike Graziano, and welcome to the final movement of the Tutorial Symphony Number 1. I want to start at the end by playing the complete orchestrated movement, and then we'll backtrack and I'll show you how it was built up layer by layer. So hold on to your seats, here's the final ride.
Now that's a rousing last movement and a fitting end, and you can leave the video here if you like, or if you're curious to look under the musical hood, you can follow along with me and see how a finale is put together. First we have to pick a form, and you have a lot of choices. A classical last movement could be a theme and variation, it could be a rondo form, but here I'll go for a sonata form. That's pretty common for a last movement. The first movement was in sonata form, the last movement can be too. It creates a natural arc, like you're coming back to where you started. And to enhance that sense of full circle unity, a common trick is to pick a theme that echoes the first movement. To remind you, here's the opening theme of the first movement, or at least the very beginning of it. I thought I'd start the final movement with the following. In a subconscious way, it'll remind you of the first movement and pull the whole symphony together. As always, start with a sketch, a continuity sketch. Work out your themes and modulations in one thread of music. I like to write the sketch in the first violins, and I'll stick in harmony notes here and there to remind myself. A sonata form starts with an extended section called the exposition. Here it starts in the key of C, the ground floor, with a series of tunes that we can call the theme one group, theme one A, one B, and so on. Then it transitions to the key of G, the second floor, and has a series of tunes, the theme two group. And the final part is the so-called closing theme. It sounds like an end, but it's in the wrong key, in G on the second floor, so we know there's more to do. But we'll tackle the exposition first. In the interests of time, I'll plop in the sketch of the whole exposition, and we'll play through it and label the themes as we go along. I want you to think about how simple these tunes are. I just dashed it off. This is about an hour of work, like improvising at the keyboard, or like sketching the outline of a face before you paint it in. And when we orchestrate it, it'll sound magnificent. It has all the right parts in all the right places. I like my last movements to have an abundance of enthusiasm, and therefore an abundance of tunes, cascading one after the next. That's why it's got theme 1A and 1B and so on. Having ended the exposition in the air in the key of G, we now need the development section which takes fragments of the tunes and uses them to create a kind of suspense story, searching and eventually finding a way back home to the key of C and to the main theme. Then we'll have the recapitulation. Here we repeat the whole exposition, but flattened out all in the key of C, and the closing theme becomes the end of the piece. Here again I'll plop in my sketch, and we can listen to it.
My development section, I think, is pushing more toward the Romantic period than the Classical. But I did it for the contrast. That intense minor key development section makes the major key triumphant chords feel more triumphant when they come back at the end. Music is all about contrast. Not just local contrast, but also large-scale contrast that creates the architecture for an entire piece. I hope the main lesson you learn here is there's no mystery. It's actually very simple. Just tunes strung together in a specific logical organization. If I can learn to do it, you can. Or at least when you listen to music, you'll be able to see into it and understand the deep structure. Now we need to go back and orchestrate. First, the strings. In classical music, the strings do most of the work, and you layer on the other instruments for flavor. Here I'm tweaking the melodic contour a little, but mostly I'm being very conservative. The string part is very simple. Here the first and second violins are doubling each other to add to the intensity of the sound, and they're playing double stops to add more noise. Let's listen to the strings by themselves in these first measures. The secret to this section, the crucial moment, is here. The music starts light, tricking you into thinking it's another cute movement and then it explodes into a glorious finale tune. So the orchestration has to be crafted to bring out that bang, which means, you guessed it, contrast. Let's make the orchestration super thin here. First, just bassoons. Then the horns can come in very quietly so you can get a bigger crescendo going. Then, bam, the big stuff. Every instrument in the orchestra. The trumpets and drums will make this chord jump up and shout. Notice also I've added another instrument since the last time. We have two flutes instead of one. It's a little change. From mid-classical to late classical, it adds more fullness to the woodwind section. I might have to go back to the earlier movements and beef up the instrumentation to balance everything out, but we'll worry about that later. Here I have the horns and bassoons doubling each other. They play nice together. They resonate together and add to the power of the sound. Let's listen to that opening and see how it works. Now that's an opening of a movement. Instead of combing through every bit, let's jump ahead, fast forward through the orchestration process to right here. The second theme, technically theme 2B. Just a delicate little tune. Let's be gentle with it and give it a quiet staccato accompaniment in the strings. Sounds like this. and so on. Let's add a little bit of horn to make the background resonate and blend together. The horn can't play one long holding note for too many measures or it'll run out of breath, so it's useful to break it up and give the player a rest. Different horns can even spell each other out. But always make sure that the entrance of each note is at an interesting place, rhythmically speaking. Here it's off beat, last beat of the measure. Maybe you won't hear this. It may disappear into the background, but it works anyway. Shifting the horn away from the downbeat prevents the music from getting too square and stodgy. We already have a woodwind sound. I had that idea when I wrote the sketch. Flutes and oboes doubling the strings. So let's listen to the section. It's too uniform for me. It needs more change. It needs more intensity in the second half. Nothing like a little offbeat counter-melody to add to the intensity. 
in the cellos and for added oomph in the bassoons, too. Now let's listen to it. Yes, that is a good example of very light orchestration that doesn't overwhelm a tune. Let's skip ahead. Here we have a crescendo. Every composer needs to learn how to write an orchestral crescendo. As usual, I'll fill in the string part first. Orchestral crescendos are special. If you play an instrument, you're used to the idea that you gradually play louder. But that's not how an orchestral crescendo works. Instruments are added to make the sound mightier, and the instruments are never added in a linear increase. It's not a simple ramp. What you need here is, mathematically, an exponential growth. Quiet, quiet, little bit more, little bit more, blah, glorious explosion of everything. Let's listen. Wow, that works. Let's skip ahead to the development section. Anything really subtle is not going to work super well on this machine, which plays digitized instruments. But let's talk about a subtle section anyway. First, let's listen again to the sketch of the very beginning of the development. It's obsessed with the first fragment of the main theme, repeating it as it moves through various keys, always searching for the home key. That's what a development section is. It's a search. Like walking through a house, in this case a spooky one, looking into different rooms, and finally at the end of the development section you find your friend, the main theme, and you're happy. Now let's try filling in the strings. Partly I'm just distributing notes, giving the violas these punchy, gritty background chords. I'm also sneaking in a counter melody here. Not much, just an arpeggio, but it's enough to give some counterpoint. It adds to the feeling of growing complexity, growing urgency. Let's listen to that. Now we need some atmospherics, and for that we'll put in some quiet sustaining notes in the background. I'm going to start with quiet horns and flutes, an unusual combo, and maybe it will give a subtle spooky sound. I'll add some low strings here too. But then, after two measures, we've had enough of that sound. The music looks into a new room in the house, and the sound needs to change, so let's switch the sustaining notes to oboes and bassoons, a little more urgency from the more nasal, penetrating sound of the reed instruments. Now the development section looks into another room in the house, and we need another sound for our background sustaining notes. How about I show you one of the most interesting uses of the trumpet? We think of it as the loud, bright, blaring instrument, but it works beautifully as a quiet background atmospheric sound. Trumpets and drums, pianissimo. I want it to sound like the development section is building, so I've thickened the sound with flutes, bassoons, horns, especially with the horns, it will all blend together nicely. A quiet but powerful sound. Now we enter into yet another harmonic room, and we need another sound. How about a really different one? We'll put this counter melody up in the oboes, and we'll put the sustaining notes down in the low bass, cellos and basses. That's ominous. It almost doesn't matter which sounds you pick. I'm bopping back and forth between different instruments. I could have picked different combos. The crucial principle here is contrast. The sounds are changing, in this case every two measures. Now let's listen to that whole section.
I hope you hear how these sustaining notes create and constantly recreate the color, the atmosphere. I could go on with other sections of the movement, but we've seen a lot now. Let's think about what kind of principles we can summarize. Always start with a sketch. Get your tunes in order first. Make them up or steal them. Heck, write a symphony based on Beatles tunes, if you like. Organize them end to end. Follow a classical formula, if you want. Or break the classical rules and organize it your own creative way. Whatever you want is the right way for your piece. Then, fill in the strings next. At least for me, that's an easy trick. It allows me to add counter melodies or harmonies or extra rhythms. Then fold in the rest of the orchestra. Color, power, variety, emphasis, that's what the rest of the orchestra is for. Sometimes the wind and brass serve the purpose of holding sustaining notes, chords or tones that hang in the background and glue everything together. Sometimes they dart in to play fragments of melodies, doubling the strings, or you can take the melody out of the strings and give it to the winds entirely. Sometimes you need loud, punchy chords like here. You can't have a real orchestral bang without the winds and brass adding power to the strings. Maybe the timpani pounds along too. But use this big sound sparingly. Any dramatic sound loses effectiveness the more you use it. In the end, you have to use your ear. No textbook principles will orchestrate for you. Do whatever sounds good to you. Explore different instrument combinations to keep the sound always changing. You're always balancing between continuity and contrast. Now, I've explained to you the final movement, and over many videos, all four movements, and we're ready to hear the entire classical symphony all in one place, a performance of the whole thing, and we'll do that in the next video.